From water to wilderness, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. On stone and in hearts, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. We continue to follow Jesus on the Lenten path this week. For where he is, we would be also. Greetings, grace, and peace to you in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And welcome to Evolve Online Worship at Bradley United Methodist Church on this third Sunday of Lent. I'm Pastor Dave, and I'm coming to you from my home office in Greenfield. And I'm Pastor Heather, and I'm coming to you from my home office in Shelbyville. And today, as a church family, we have um, several prayer requests that I'd like to share with you. Uh, first, I'd like you to be in prayer with Lauren Votaw, Mark, and Ann Vale's daughter. She is currently hospitalized. And also, Angela Woolen. Uh, she is also hospitalized and um, Jerry Rogers he was hospitalized this week but is at home recovering now and then I'd ask you to be in prayer with Nancy Vaughn her daughter Cheryl has been um, put into hospice and Nancy is with her in Missouri now and then also just be with all the prayer concerns that are um, not spoken but are in our hearts and also, we want to remind you that this is the last uh, Evolve online worship. I want to thank you all for uh, your participation in, uh, in what certainly was uh, an evolution of worship as we uh, learn to do this online. Uh, but next week, we uh, will be back in person in the Bradley United Methodist Church Sanctuary uh, for full classic traditional worship at its finest. I uh, can, can tell you now that, that it appears very certain that the time for that will be 945. So as you're making plans, plan for a 945 service at Bradley next week. You know, the cross and Jesus' suffering runs quite counter to most world religions. And even good Christians seek to minimize our emphasis on Christ's broken body and, and blood spilled for the forgiveness of our sin. And today we're reminded to cling to the cross of Christ as our symbol of hope and our future with God. Welcome to worship. Thank you for your faithfulness. We're glad you're here. Please allow me to call us to worship as we praise God for the glory of God's creation and word. This is Psalm 19 verses 1 through 10. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb.
pray. Gracious God, whose power is made perfect in weakness, whose wisdom appears as foolishness in this world, we thank you for the scandal of the cross. In Jesus Christ, you overturn all our usual ways of behaving and believing. You scatter our false notions of discipleship as easily as coins are spilled from a box. Raz to ruins what is distorted in us and raise us to new life as a community so that we may be the body of Christ in and for the world. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 through 25. Hear now the word of the Lord. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. May God's blessing be upon the ministry of the word among us here today. Let us pray. God of glory, we cannot hear the heavens proclaim your handiwork though the speech of the skies must be magnificent. We cannot hear what day and night are singing about you, though their song must be both bright and deep. Yet somehow you are made known to us through our own foolish proclamation. Open our ears to what you are saying to us today, we pray. And perhaps we may also hear echoes of your glory in the broad firmament above. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I remember one night, um, actually many years ago, I was working late, uh, actually uh, quite late. Late has turned into early because the clock had long since struck midnight. And I was um, mailing out bulletins. It was the last thing I needed to do before I retired for the night. And as I was doing that, I heard my instant messenger alert go off. It was our son, Nathan, always the night owl, sitting at his desk in his room at Taylor University. The fact that we were communicating by instant messenger tells you how old this memory is. You may remember AOL's instant messenger is what we used before we started texting. On this particular day, though, I hadn't seen Nathan all day long online. So I decided to let late become later, and we talked for a while. That day, he and the rest of his freshman class had attended their first chapel service on campus at Taylor, and Nathan was excited. And you know, I, I think elated is a better word. I remember he typed that night, wow, ch chapel was awesome. And so just making a little small type talk, I typed back, so what was awesome about it? Was it the music, the preaching? He said, yeah, the music was awesome, and the, the whole campus was there. So I pried a little bit more. Well, how was the preaching, I asked. He responded, oh, all right, I guess. Not quite like home. He was obviously not as excited about this part of the service. Now, I thought to myself, it's way too early for him to be sucking up to me because he's out of money. So I asked, what was missing? He typed, well, there wasn't anything about the cross in the sermon. And what I really like about your sermons, Dad, is that you always remind us of the cross. 
Wow, this memory brought tears to my eyes this week as I realized that even as I approached the end of my preaching career, it was all worthwhile knowing that those who know me best, like my son Nathan, recognize that I preached the Christ with a cross. I preached Christ crucified and Christ risen in glory every Sunday. And preaching the cross is not always the easiest or most popular thing to do. Several years before his death, Billy Graham was asked, how has your preaching changed over the last 40 years? Well, Graham replied, now I preach more on the cross. That's where the power is. Well, I'm certainly squarely with Reverend Graham on this, but author and pastor Dr. Bill Buchnott extends this. He says that is also where the opposition is. You see, Satan doesn't mind too much if the church will do nothing more than teach the golden rule. And Satan has no problem if the church feeds the hungry as long as we never mention Jesus. But it drives the evil one crazy for us to talk about Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, and God incarnate dying on the cross for the sins of humanity. But even with all this said, I'm not so naive as to believe that everyone believes like I do on this. I know there are those out there, many of whom are leaders in our churches and seminaries, who believe we should sanitize our faith of the unpleasant images of suffering and death that the cross evokes. I think Paul addresses these beliefs in our lessons when he writes, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, this letter wasn't written to us or to our 21st century culture, which fosters free speech and comparatively easy access to the media for the message of salvation to be broadcast. Now, this passage was written to small groups, small groups of the weak and afflicted who had little or no political power and who met in households always under the threat of severe persecution by both religious and civic leaders. Given this context and the relatively close proximity of the memories of how Jesus was treated and how Jesus died on the cross, these groups wouldn't have necessarily been the most outreaching folks, it seemed. In fact, given all this, it would seem more likely that their natural desire would be to go underground where it was safe. But we know, don't we, that going underground just isn't the way of the gospel. Paul knew that. And so did the believers in those small house churches that this letter was written to. It seems more likely that Paul was encouraging them and, and us to live the gospel within our community, not from underground, and, and, and to live it in a way that commands respect from all people. You know, in his commentary on Romans, F.F. F. Bruce contends that all in the cases in the Pauline epistles, refers to all in Christ. All in Christ without distinction. All in Christ without distinction of socioeconomic or religious status. From this point of view, God is the God of all and cares for all by offering Christ and his sacrifice for sin for all. And Christ indeed came desiring that all would be saved without distinction. And so this Lenten season, I will continue to preach about the cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. You see, the cross is part of our Easter destination. It's part of our destination on this journey of Lent, and it is where our faith gets its power. So once again, as we celebrate the power of Christ in the great thanksgiving, let us remember. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In love, you made us for yourself, 
and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remained steadfast. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare for the jo with joy for the Easter feast, that, renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and beca became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself, a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And so we remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he was sharing in a meal with his disciples, at one point in the meal he took the bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had blessed it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sin for you and for many. Take and drink. And as often as you eat of the loaf and drink of the cup, this do in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and juice, Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord invites to the table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. You need not be a member of this church, the United Methodist Church, or any other church or denomination to participate in Holy Communion with us here today. The Lord welcomes you to the table, and so do we. Let us participate together in the sacrament of Holy Communion. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ given for you. Amen. <laughs>
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit, to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who loves us and who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we close, I would re remind you to note that the post or email that brought you to the link to this online worship experience contains a link to our online giving portal. As you feel led, please use that link to give thanks to God with your gifts, tithes, and offerings, or send your offering to the church directly at 210 West Main Street, Greenfield, Indiana, 46140. We continue to be thankful for your generosity. may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Go now in peace to love and serve your Lord in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't forget, next week we're back in person, March 14th, 9.45 a.m. Is, is what I'm projecting at this point. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. We will worship. We will sing. Um, you know, we might even dance. Who knows? Uh, but until then, be blessed. Be safe. Be encouraged. And above all, be God's.
Bye-bye now.